So while they make their way to the back and, and get figured out, um, Crystal told you about the area over here, and she said to entertain you during the sermon. I was wondering if that was a little jab, uh, but I let that one go until she said, let's cheer that PJ isn't going to talk next week. <clears throat> And then I thought it humorous that she took all of my sermon time today. So I guess she wanted me not to talk for two weeks in a row. So um, there we go. We today, it's going to be really simple. Uh, we're just wrapping up. And, and I want to read the passage together. And we're not putting anything on a screen. There are some Bibles on the chairs. So if you did not bring a Bible, we always want to encourage you, bring your own Bible. Keep, when, when you come to worship... To have the word of God with you. And we are encouraging you still. Every single day. To just open it up. If you need to start by reading one verse a day. Read one verse. If you need help to know where to go for that verse. I send something out every day. We have the soul 30 that goes out every day. Chris has been doing that. I'm going to do a few of those. Um, so we've got this stuff. We've got resources for you. If you need help to know where to go. We'll help you to know where to go. But if it's just one verse a day, God can use one verse and, and 15 seconds that it takes to read it. And maybe that's where you are. And then it might build. <clears throat> and then you might want to read a chunk or a section to see what surrounds that verse. Because context is important. And then you might want to read a chapter. But don't think that, oh, if I don't read a whole chapter, I'm not really reading the Word of God. Um... There's some wise people that have done a lot more time in prayer than I have who have said that when they're reading, if a verse speaks to them and if it's the first verse they read, they stop. Stop right there. And think about it. And let it keep speaking to you. And what does it want to say to you? Because it's, it's just this, although it says it's living and active. But it's really God speaking. And so I just want to encourage you, even if it's one verse, or whenever there's a verse that speaks to you, let God speak to you through that verse. The one verse that we have been focusing on for the last four weeks, and we wrap it up today, is Micah chapter 6, verse 8. So if you will do me a favor and open that up. Open up to Micah chapter 6, verse 8. If you've got a phone and you want to do this on your phone, feel free to do it on your phone. I want to give everybody a second to get there because we're going to read it together. And I, re I realize some of you might have an NIV. Some of you might have King James. Some of you might have who knows what version. That's okay. I don't care if the versions are different. I don't care if we're slightly uh, on, on different words as we read it. Let's read it together. Because we're going to get the same idea. Because God's word, no matter what you translate it into, the ESV, the King James, the NIV, whatever, it's still the same. It's still God's word. And God's word still speaks. So Micah 6, 8, everybody got a chance to get there? You got your phones, got your Bibles? All right, we're going to read it together. So will you join me? He has told you, oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. But to do justice. The way the version that we translated when we put it on our shirt is act justly. Instead of to love kindness, we have love mercy. And then to walk humbly. And we're going to have to reprint the shirts with your God. With your God. Over and over in scripture, we hear that word, your. What is the greatest commandment? Somebody asked Jesus. And Jesus responded to tell the greatest commandment. And he said, you should love the Lord, what? Your God. Okay? There's, there's something important about that. To love the Lord, your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then to love your neighbor as yourself. It's, it's all over that verse. 
to love the Lord your God. There's something important about that. We're going to look at that just briefly here today because we're wrapping this up. Over the last few weeks, we have looked at all the different aspects. Four weeks ago, we did a service project. A few of us were gone, but about 60 people gathered together and you went and acted justly. Notice all of these are action. Okay? All of these three things are action. And um, it's my belief that God used wisdom when he did that. What does the Lord require of you? Because I've been in the Lutheran church pretty much all my life, except for when I left for a little while, because I was exploring. And then I came back. But I've been a Christian all my life, except when I kind of dabbled with is that really right? And are there some other things? And I searched out the different religions and to, to see what I really thought was true and what I really believed. But it's got to be personal. It's got to be yours. Um, I really believe though, being in the Lutheran church, that we have done this great job with education and knowledge. And we've done a horrible job with living it. For the world to see. Would anybody agree? Okay. We want to change that. And I think that's why God did this. Notice he didn't say. What does the Lord require of you? To know this. And to know that. And to know the final thing. To know that God wants justice. To know that he wants uh, there to be loving kindness. And to know that he wants humility. He didn't say that's what he requires. He said, here's what I want. Because you know Jesus and have a relationship, I want you to do something with it. I want you to put it into action. I want you to act justly. There's action. I want you to love Mercy. There's action in that. And that to me is the most difficult one. I want you to walk humbly with your God. And so then three weeks ago after we did the one service project where we went out and, and acted it out. We, we went on a Sunday morning and, and served three different groups of people. Well then three weeks ago we talked about what it means to act justly. And very simply put, if you weren't here or just for a recap. The way that I would phrase that is simply this. Do the right thing. It's that simple. God is calling us to do the right thing. And so wherever you are, in whatever circumstances, especially when it's hard, God says, I want you to do the right thing. Because the rest of the world might not. They're going to do what's easy or what benefits them. Does the right thing always benefit you? Yes or no? No. Is the right thing sometimes very humbling? Absolutely. Is the right thing challenging because people might not want to hang out with us anymore? And that hurts. The right thing is the right thing. And that's part of what acting justly is all about. Loving mercy, just to recap that. We talked about this in our group. Um, apparently, if you were here then two weeks ago, not last week, but two weeks ago, I was gone. I was with Sarah. And so Chris shared with us on loving mercy. And... Um, I have yet to listen to, I got to make a confession, I have yet to listen to your sermon, okay? But I have heard from my dad who's been involved in the church for a long time. My dad said, Chris, I heard him preach six, eight years ago and he always did a good job. But wow, how he has grown in his ability to communicate the word of God and to speak it. You'd never know he wasn't trained to do this. It's beautiful because Chris didn't go through seminary. Chris isn't a quote unquote pastor. I believe he is. And we're going to maybe try to find a label for him. Don't turn me in please. Um, but to me he's a pastor. Because he's a shepherd. Because he's discipling people and raising them up. And he's proclaiming the word of God. And so he proclaimed the word of God and you learned everything you ever wanted to know about poop two weeks ago. And if you want to know what that means, go listen to it. 
uh, it's on our website. And then last week, we, we oh, oh, but, but I want, what I want to share, we talked about loving mercy at our community group on Friday night. Because we looked at all three of these. And the way I would put that is simply this. What God is asking for us as the body of Christ, as his followers, and this is challenging. Sometimes you don't need to really listen to all my fluff and my stories. Listen to this. This is worth remembering. This is worth writing down. Not because I came up with it. No. This is worth remembering and writing down because this captures the heart of Of what it means to love mercy. That needs to be our default when we're dealing with people. What is your default? You know, every, um, every word program has a default font that it goes back to. And you've got a default that you do. We're just wired that way. What is your default when you're dealing with people? Is it judgmental? Is it judgment? Is that our default? I'm better than you are? Is it criticism? Is it anger? Is it offense? Do we easily take offense at other people? Our default as the body of Christ is to love mercy. That's what we show. We show mercy. Do they always deserve mercy? Yes or no? (laughs) No, that's the whole point of mercy. You don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. But you receive it instead. And so, to love mercy means that our default is going to be to love people and to show them mercy even when it's hard, no matter what they've done to us. That's the second thing. The final thing is to walk humbly with God. Walk is action. Walk really means live. Those words are used interchangeably. And so last week we kind of looked at the walk humbly. And we looked at not just reading scripture and spending time in prayer. Though everything flows out of that. Everything flows out of that. When we're not reading scripture, spending time in prayer. And we're just trying to live the right way. way, Honestly, we're probably doing it for the wrong reason. Or we're not doing it with the right heart. Everything flows from the relationship with Jesus. Everything flows then from the time we spend in his word. And everything flows from the time we spend in prayer. It's from that relationship with him. And so we looked at that a little bit last week. And so that's our our recap. And then today, just to, to pull it all together. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Three actions to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. And then those final three words. With your God. Now, when we hear this, and when we see it on a shirt, don't we honestly kind of think it's act justly, period. Love mercy, period. And walk humbly with your God, period. Would we agree? Is that the way many of us have heard it? I'm curious, has anybody thought of it that way or heard it that way? Okay? But you said no. Yeah. Because what? It is. Well, in the Hebrew, there aren't because they don't have those. In the Hebrew, they don't have periods either. You just kind of guess and pick based on the context. But if we try to act justly without our God, are we really acting justly? Not at all. You can't do it. I mean, the world tries to do it and the world tries to show justice. But there's actually this verse in Scripture that says, apart from Him, there's nothing good. And so we can try to bring justice to someone and we can go through the motions, but honestly, we're just spinning our wheels because ultimately it's going to fall apart. It's not going to help anything. Act justly is connected to with your God. And so I want you to think of it that way. And if someone ever asks, what is your church about? Well, we want to act justly with our God. You see, a lot of people do social justice. They do social justice, but they separate it from Jesus. And so, what is the problem 
with social justice separated from Jesus? Does anybody have a guess? How do you do that? They do it all the time though. All kinds of organizations that do social justice, but they separate it from Jesus. Anybody have a, a problem with that? What would be the final big problem with social justice separated from Jesus? I'll give you a scenario, okay? Uh, let's go to a third world country that just had a typhoon. There's lots of them. They've had this before. They get wiped out. There's masses of people who are dead. There's hungry. There's needy. Uh, homes have been destroyed. Now you have orphans because moms and dads were killed. And maybe the kids were spared for some reason. There's sheer devastation. And so there's an orphaned child. There's an orphaned child. And this child obviously is going to need food, right? Do we want to give him food? All right. Do we need to go back to the basics? Do we want to give the orphan child food? Absolutely. Do we want to show him love? Or her? Okay. Do we want to give them um, some instruction? That is someone that can help raise them. Uh, maybe it's an adopted parent. Maybe it's a, a, an orphanage or something like that. People who can care for him and nurture him? Yes. Do we want to give him an education? Yes. So what if we go in and we do all of those things apart from the name of Jesus because we don't care at all about Jesus and this kid does not know Jesus and then he grows up to be a young man that doesn't know Jesus and then he becomes an adult that doesn't know Jesus and then he dies not knowing Jesus. Did we help him at all? No. Absolutely not. Because this life is about that big and then you got all of eternity. And Gary, are you raising your hand? Or are you just saying amen? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and organizations that do social justice, that's, that's just not in their, in their mindset. You know, they just want to meet the specific need. And I'm all about meeting the need with your God. Act justly with your God. And so when we do something for someone, you don't have to say, oh, by the way, I did this because I love Jesus. Okay? But you can Say something that points in that direction. The second one, to love mercy with your God. We don't just put up with people who are difficult, and that's all of us. Because we're just really good people, or we're really patient, or we do it because of the love and the mercy of God. We do it with our God. We love mercy because He showed us mercy first. And we walk humbly. Not just walking humbly in the world that means always having your head down and, and being, you know, I'm no good at anything and I'm worthless. No, that is not walking humbly. Walking humbly is simply recognizing who God is. That's what we looked at last week. And seeing ourselves in comparison to Him and giving Him the glory, which is what you're saying right there. Everything we do to give God the glory. All of them are with your God. But here's the, the, the final thing I just want to point out. It's the word with. Over and over in scripture, we're told that God wants to be with us. God makes promises to us over and over again in scripture. For lo, I will be with you always until the very end of the age. In the Old Testament, he said the same thing to Joshua. Do not worry, do not fear, do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And so over and over again in scripture, we have God letting us know that he wants to be with us. We just sang the, at the very beginning, Song of Hope. God of heaven, come down. He came down to be with us. To become one of us. Not to be separated from us. But he came down to be with us. And so we always look at how 
God is with us. And, and let's be honest, does that give us a little bit of encouragement? Does that seem like law or gospel that God is with you and he loves you wherever you are and whatever you've done? Is that law or gospel? That seems like a whole lot of gospel, right? Now, let's look at this, flip it around, okay? You got this? Now let's flip it around. And he wants you to be with him. Do we look at that as law or gospel? I think we look at it as law. I think we look at it as law. He wants to be with us. Oh, that's great. I want to be with him. And that means picking up the word of God. Law, I have to read the word of God. That means spending time in prayer. Law, it's what I have to do. That means not going and, and doing what the rest of the world does because I want to be with God where he is. Law, because I wanted to go and get drunk and have, you know, whatever at that party like everybody else. That's often the way we think, let's be honest. It becomes law. But what a beautiful thing it is. It, it's actually gospel. And this is the key. And this is the dividing line. Because God makes a promise to the whole world. I will be with you. And he offers that to everybody. But then he says. But here's the key. I want you. To be with me. I want you. To be with me. Do you see the difference? God being with you. Have you ever been with someone who is enamored by you? Okay, you're, you're walking with them or you're at lunch with them or you dinner with them. Remember back to maybe junior high, high school, dating, all this stuff. And you were enamored with someone and they weren't enamored with you or they were in love with you and you could have cared less about them. Have you ever been in that kind of a situation? Don't tell me you're in it now, okay? Okay, good. Okay, because y'all need to be loving each other. That's all good. Um, I bet we've all experienced that. Have you experienced it? Okay. For many of us, that's the way it is with God. And that's a one-way relationship. Is that relationship going to work real well? <laughs> no. Are those two people going to get married? Nope. Or they shouldn't. If one is enamored with the other and the other could care less. And so a lot of times it's God saying, I want to be with you. 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 I am enamored with you. I, I love you. I am passionate about you. I came down to the world for you. I became a human being for you. I sacrificed my life for you. And what do I want from you? Anybody have a guess? A relationship. I want you to be with me. And that's the dividing line. It isn't about our parents and what they believed. It's not about what church we grew up in. It's not about how much we know. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Believing in him as Lord and Savior. Spending time with him as a friend. And he invites us to have that relationship with him. Uh, you know those shirts that say, I'm with him. They have like an arrow. And you'll see like a new bride wearing it sometimes. And the arrow's pointing to the guy and you can tell they're like honeymooners and stuff. We saw some of those in Mexico actually. Um, I'm with him. Now there's another shirt that I think is kind of humorous. But uh, a little bit more crass. Have you seen that one? I'm with stupid. <laughs> yeah, Sarah wears that shirt. So um, she doesn't wear the I'm with him shirt. She wears the I'm with stupid shirt. But I was, I was thinking about those shirts. I'm with him. I'm with stupid. And that whole phrase. And then I thought about some of those movies where you have the little bitty character. And I don't even remember. There's a kid's movie that's kind of like this. Little bitty character standing up to the big giant enemy. And the big giant enemy then turns and runs away. And little bitty character is like, ha, 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 yeah, you're afraid of me. Little bitty character didn't know there was great big character behind little bitty character that scared away. Yeah, that's one. There's another. Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. There, there's a lot of movies that do that. That's what came to my mind. 
as I'm living life, I'm with him. You got a problem with me? I'm with him. Okay, you're allowed to have a problem with me, that's okay, because I'm with him. And so, am I going to be scared? No, I'm going to be the little chihuahua that's like, yeah, you better back up, look at this. Because I got a great big God behind me, and I'm with him, and he's with me. Right? All right, now's where you have to act like you're, I'm Tony Evans. Amen! Amen. <laughs> I'm with him. And he's with me. And it's a reciprocal relationship. And that's what God desires. And that's what Micah 6, 8, I think is all about. He showed you what's good. What does he require to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly? With your God. Not to run the race by yourself because you can't do it. He desires the relationship with us. He wants us to desire the relationship with him. And it's actually gospel because it's the best thing that we could ever have. We may look at it as law, but it's not. And so that's just my encouragement as we wrap this up today. And then as the kids will share with us next week, maybe it's something from that or maybe it's something from another verse that they've read from their Soul 30 challenge. But it's just to remember that I'm with him and he's with me. Let's try that together because I was looking for like you to join with me there. Okay? Just, just a hint. So I'm just going to try that again. So when I'm facing a challenge or when I'm going through life and I have a difficult decision to make or there's something really horrible that's about to take place, I don't have to be afraid. I can be completely confident. Why? Because I'm with him and he's with me. And so you got to take on both of us. Amen, brother. Amen, dad. <laughs> Tony Evans didn't ever get that. So. Okay, all right. Um, and so that's just, that's just my encouragement today. You know, let's, let's be with him. He's with us. He's with us. Are we with him? Let's be with him. Open up the word of God. One verse. Spend time in prayer. Look at what a relationship with Jesus is really all about. See how much he loves you and wants to be with you. And then he invites you to come. Come to me. All who are weary and burdened. Don't lead the way. Don't take the burden on your shoulders. <laughs> You're with him. You aren't for him. Doing this for him. And he's just sitting there watching you're working with him because it's his power in you I'm with him and he's with me